What's your opinion on the current creator culture online? Anybody with some crazy idea or whatever can really put it out there and look pretty legitimate. And so you, it's, it's also a dangerous age of like knowing what is truth. I think a lot of people think about their own mental health in the wrong way. And it's really not emphasized enough about how you can become a person who contributes to the world in meaningful ways. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking part in this immersive listening experience. A meaningful existence is a moving target that no matter how close, will always be out of reach. We hope this message finds you with an outstretched hand. As we attempt to uncover complex truths, remember, life's toughest questions can be answered if we all just focus on one thing. Being good people. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Good People, episode 37. Today, I was joined for the third time by Ethan Schindler. He is the owner of Bastrop Fitness Project in Bastrop, Texas. At this point, if you've been listening to Good People, you know who Ethan is. He is now the honorary co-host of Good People, and we always appreciate having him on the show. In today's episode, Ethan and I talked about the current state of content creation on the internet, his views on the drawbacks of the education system, and what everybody's getting wrong about their mental health. In other news, this episode is brought to you by Die Tired. If you're watching on YouTube, the hat that I'm wearing is from Die Tired. They also have a sick crew neck sweatshirt and a couple of t-shirts on there for you to check out as well. If you guys head on over to dietiredco.com and like what you see and you support what we're doing here at Good People, use code GP15 at checkout for 15% off. In other, other news, if you are watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe and turn on our notifications so you don't miss our weekly uploads. Any interaction you have with our channel really does help us out a ton. Enjoy the show. Well, how are you really, man? I'm, I'm happy to have you back on the show. You might as well be the good people co-host, I think, at this point. But uh, I was thinking know, that, man. Like, I'm like, can we make this like a permanent gig? Like, we can just do all the episodes together and like have your guests on and then like we'll have like this like, uh, uh, you know, three-way conversation because, no, I love it. Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm honored that you always uh, invite me to come on. It, it makes... I love having the conversations and it, and it makes, you know, it, it's super fun. So, um, I'm doing good. Yeah. Crazy, all kinds of crazy stuff going on in my life, but like it keeps it, keeps it exciting. Yeah. I obviously follow you on social media and it is a shame that we really only chat when we record a podcast, but, um, it seems like you're pretty busy, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I stay busy and I've got my hands in a lot of different things and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ambitious to a fault. So that kind of like, uh, it always keeps it exciting. What is the newest thing that you got your hands on? The new thing that I'm working on the most right now is a little bit of a passion project. Um, the Bass Drop Team Fit Challenge. And, uh, so I'm getting all the employers in my county together to put together teams of people and they're going to agree to, you know, they're going to sign up for events. Like I created 13 different types of events that they could sign up for. They could do one or more event. Um, and, uh, they're going to train up for 12 weeks and we're going to have our own little employer Olympics, um, on, uh, April 6th. So, um, we're going to figure out who the fittest company in Bass Drop is. Oh, very cool. What kind of events have you put together? Is it CrossFit style stuff or is it just a mix of Whatever. No, purposely not CrossFit style stuff. It's like, um, you know, uh, there is, uh, for example, um, there's a uh, body weight medley where you, there's an individual and team version of this, but you could, you would do as many push ups, sit ups, air squats, and uh, pull ups as you could in uh, 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. So the, the individual version of that is break it up any way you want, kind of strategize how you need to, to get 12, 12 or to get as many as you can. And then the, the team version is, is like, you're the push up guy. I'm the air squat guy. Someone else is the pull up guy. And you do as many as you can in three minutes for a total combined score. Um, so that's probably the most CrossFit -y thing of all of it. Uh, the other things are, um, we're going to do a strength super total. So the power lifts plus the Olympic lifts, um, we're going to do a uh, straight up track events. So like a 100 meter sprint, a 400 meter sprint, 
uh, so on and so forth. Um, there's a obstacle course. So I was able to uh, get the obstacle course over here on the, the local military post. And so like a legitimate military obstacle course. Um, and then the least athletic thing is there's a body composition category. So, okay. um, so you would, um, uh, you sign up for either a fat loss challenge or a muscle gain challenge. Okay. There's going to be one team member that starves themselves to win that category. <laughs> yeah. There's always that guy who takes it for the team, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, man. What's the, what's the why behind that? So the big why for me is I want Bastrop to be the healthiest city in Texas. I, I want to live in the healthiest city in my state. And I know that employers play a major role in whether or not people are healthy and fit or not. Plus, from a political standpoint, like if someone was going to give this objective qualification of, OK, you objectively are the fittest city in this state. You know, certainly there's going to be metrics for that. Right. And and I'm thinking, OK, how many employers are actively engaged in the health and wellness of of their employees? You know, what is this the local government doing to make sure that their uh, residents are all fit? You know, so those are things that I'm I'm actively got my fingers in from like a, a local politics standpoint as I'm trying to make this big play to make us the biggest, the healthiest city in Texas. Oh, very cool. That's something that I've been giving actually kind of a bit of thought to is that, you know, I work with a lot of busy professionals as well. And fitness is always the last thing that people can do. Or once everything's good in their life, now it's time for me to get in shape. Right. And I always, I don't know why that is. And obviously I think some people will hear me say that and go, yeah, man, you don't, you know, you're 23, you don't have kids, you don't have a, a job, which a hundred percent, I hear that. But I do think that that challenge of making your fitness, like the first priority, not first priority necessarily in terms of like more important than your family, but fitness is the thing that from an outside perspective, the busy people that I know that are really consistent with their fitness and they make sure that they get it in that's kind of the glue that holds all the other stuff together. So I think yep. for the people that do struggle with it, who um, have a hard time being consistent in the gym and would, and would hear me say, you've got to make fitness a priority would be like, yeah, right, buddy. Good luck. And in, in a decade, but I don't, I don't know if that's true. Like I, it's just so important to have that, that thing because it, it makes you, I would almost even recommend for certain populations, obviously sleep is very important, but like between eight and nine hours of sleep and not working out and seven hours of sleep and an hour workout in the morning, like I would take the, I would take the less sleep for the workout. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, I think, and that's really why I do what I do. I mean, what I learned early on in my life and then what I kept coming back to over and over again and why I abandoned my old career to be a, to, to go into fitness and own gyms and stuff is exactly what you're saying. I think, I think it's backwards how we all look at our physical fitness and our health. We think that, oh, when I've taken care of my career and I've taken care of my family and I've taken care of everything else, then I'll have the luxury of being able to take care of my fitness or whatever. And what I'm saying is that that's completely opposite. When you are fit, when you are healthy, you are going to resonate at high levels. You're going to vibrate at high levels. Your mechanism of getting everything else done is going to be optimal. And that other shit's going to be so much easier, you know, and, and that's really you know, that's, that is the core of why I do what I do. Why do you think that it's backwards? Well, part of it is we are still babies. We're infants and toddlers socially where we remember we came from a, we came from a, you know, hunter gatherers and, all, you know, our ancestors moved all the time because they had to like, you know what I mean? It was like, you know, we are now at a, at a advanced stage of like technology where it's, we're still kind of new to figuring this out. You know, everybody worked their asses off. They, it was like, let's work. And that is my fitness. That is my health. And that kind of just took care of that for us. We didn't have to think about or actively carve out time for it. And I think that yeah. like, we're still toddlers in, in this new age and we will eventually come to the realization that we had that all wrong. But 
right now it's not the it's not the common discourse. Yeah, that makes sense. I think about that too. It's hilarious the fact that there are buildings that have things in them that we go to and we pick them up multiple times just so that we <laughs> we can improve right? our fitness. Like, yeah, you it, you didn't think about your health and fitness when you were when the objective of every day was to go and hunt a deer and have meat or what, or for your family. Yeah. Or farm or whatever, you know, it's, um, I think it's going to, I think about this a lot, you know, like how, and somehow I ended up on Facebook has new algorithms or whatever. So I get all these new posts that end up in my feed about, and I'm into archeology span and like studying history. And it's like the things they dig out of the dirt. And we now as modern people, like make all this speculation about what this thing was like, imagine when someone digs up a barbell, from from in like a thousand years from now or what are they going to be thinking about what this thing is or how primitive we were or, you know we're going to be the cavemen yeah. of yeah. some future in the textbook, of it's going to say they stabbed each other with these blunt <laughs> objects <laughs> this what this heavy weapon that they yield against each other to bash their skulls or something you know <laughs> yeah that's hilarious um <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know what the answer to that is other than, you know, people like us that are, you know, I guess working with people in the fitness industry and trying to show them that. But yeah, it's tough. And it's it's easy for me to say that because I'm, it's so obvious to me every single day that I, I do that. You know, I have a very, I, every day I work out and I acknowledge that I feel better afterwards just strengthens the proof to me that the fitness is the thing that makes all of the other stuff better. Um but it's hard to, it's hard to learn those lessons when you are in those high stress environments where, you know, when you're worrying about how much money am I going to make on this check? Like, are my kids going to, do they know that we're struggling right now? Things like that. I, I definitely, both of those things are true. You know, it's very hard to do it, but it's important to try to figure out how to do it. Yeah. And there's the, the pressures of, of career, right? Like, I mean, like you, you know, when your boss is like telling you, you need to do better, you need to do better. I mean, your first thing is like, cut everything else out. Let me just focus on my job, you know, because that's who the, that's the squeaky wheel. That's, that's the, that's the loudest noise of telling you you're not doing a good job. You don't really hear your body until much later telling you like, Hey, you need this. Yeah. I'm interested. I want to talk to you about this. What are your, what's your opinion on the current creator culture online. I almost feel like what we're going through right now is the creator revolution where everybody's making content online, myself included, obviously, but yeah, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are like broadly on, on, on what it is we're seeing online. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're 100 percent right. It's so easy now. Like I could have a phone and a couple apps and I can become a creator, you know, and with high quality, you know, and I think it's so easy to break bust into it. You know, it's kind of like the how music what happened with music, probably like a decade or, or a little more than a decade ago, where I used to have to go to a studio with all this huge equipment and everything else for me to make music. And now I can and now it's gotten smaller and easier. And so. My, my thought, on, I'm torn on it because I'm actually, it's funny. I'm actually going through this thought process right now for myself is I would like to create my own personal brand, like who I, how I want to show up for the world and how I want to contribute to all the people in my life. We are in an age where, you know, you get that message out through these platforms that are created for us, you know, the, the Instagrams, the TikToks, the, the Facebooks and all that stuff. And I personally don't like recording everything that's going on in my life. And like the, 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 you know, I, I don't enjoy that, but I'm also seeing the need for like, if I want to show up in the world the best way that I possibly can and really make, make a difference. Like when I die, I'm laying on my deathbed and like, did I make a difference? I think we're in an age where you kind of have to have a brand and you have to have you have to be putting that out there through these platforms. And so I'm really wrestling with that personally with it. So um, I think it's damn I mean, I think there's a lot of like, it's, it's hard too, because the, anyone, any knucklehead, anybody with some crazy idea or, or whatever can really put it out there and look pretty legitimate and look pretty knowledgeable. And so you, it's, it's also a dangerous age of like knowing what is truth. What is fact? Do you know who Dan Coe is? 
Dan Co. Yeah. No. He is an online creator. Uh, I he I think he mostly does a lot of writing now, uh, and I'm not sure if he has a book, but uh, he's a writer, online content creator, very much in the same space that you and I are interested in, which is like self improvement, philosophy, those mm-hmm. that kind of guy. Yeah, and he has this theory that in like 20 years our education system is going to be drastically different and the people on the front of it are going to be creators. And so um, the the top of the top, you know, think of like the biggest platforms, Joe Rogan, Modern Wisdom uh, with Chris Williamson, uh, Dax Shepard and his armchair expert. There's obviously a bunch of big podcasts that I'm not familiar with just because I, I don't really consume a lot of stuff outside of that, that world. But uh, these will be the places that we go to for our education. So whether it's through like an online course or a free podcast, this is how we're, we're going to learn. And I, I like that idea because something that I'm trying to do with the show now is focus a little bit more on the education. I have a couple of uh, interviews lined up with researchers and I'm, I'm going to go into the research that they conducted papers that they've written um, talk about, I'm, I'm speaking to somebody in a couple weeks on, um, I'm not sure if he came up with it or if he just studied it and it was already a pre-existing system, but it is a, uh, something he calls news finds me. So my generation, uh, we consume our news by letting it come to us, you know, on Twitter, on Instagram, we're scrolling, we see it, uh, and he's studying the implications of it and a bunch of other factors related to it. But I think that when it comes to creation, using it as a tool to educate yourself and other people is great. What I get so, I mean, I, I get so frustrated by it when I see it, when it's like, if you want to make it one K extra per month, comment freedom in the comment section for my, and I'll, and I'll DM you my whatever. I'm like, everybody's doing that. And it yeah. feels to me like it felt cryptocurrency in 2018, 2019 NFTs like two years ago where everybody all of a sudden started doing it. And I can't help but feel that in some way, I don't know what, I don't know if crash is the right term for it, but there's going to be some sort of creator crash where it's things change. It's just not the same. You know, I don't really know what that would look like, but I don't know. It just feels like that to me. Yeah, I think so. And I kind of hope so. Like, right. Like I, I, I have a lot of faith in like our collective wisdom as, as people, you know, there's a lot of like stupid stuff that happens out there, but collectively, I think there's a wisdom that we all share and like, we will be able to see the, um, the, you know, the, the, the trees to the forest, you know, and I think that there probably will be some adaptations. What gets it gets me excited though, kind of about what you said about the, the gentleman, Dan Co, who, uh, is it Co C O E K O E K O E. Okay. What gets me excited is like, when you start talking about it, education, I start getting excited because like, I have a major issue with education as it is now. And I certainly, I would love for a major paradigm shift in education. I don't know that I agree with what he says about like, there being like, it can be like creators, but what we need is disruptors. I think we need, maybe it's creators because they have a voice, they have a platform and they have a, they have an audience, you know, that maybe they will be the ones who change uh, education in some way, shape or form. But I mean, a common term that we throw around that you've probably used and a lot of people use is like YouTube university, right? Like anything you really want to know, you go to (laughs) YouTube university to learn it. And I think that is truth, right? Like I, I, if I want to fix something in my house, I don't need to go to school to become a tradesman. I just go to YouTube now. Right. So, so I do think that there is some level of truth to that. And I really do hope, you know, I was a horrible failure in school. Uh, I was not a successful student but I'm not a stupid guy, right? Like I have a bill, I have abilities and uh, school just didn't work for me. So I do hope that somehow somebody, I don't care who it is, overhauls the current system that we have. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about this because I'm, I'm not anti education. Mm-hmm. I'm, I would say I'm more like pro college lifestyle. 
I think that that was a, I don't regret going to college, not because of what I learned, but because of having four years to be in a, in this almost confined space, you know, like obviously you have the freedom to travel wherever, but like you're on campus, especially your first year you live there. You're with a bunch of other people, your age, just full of hormones and, you know, you, everybody's doing drugs and drinking alcohol and you learn a lot about yourself and others being able to go through a time like that. And so yeah, part of me, I, I am a much different guy after I finished college than when I went into it. I found yeah, I, my love of fitness through college. And if I didn't have that time, man, I went to college so shy and a bit awkward and I left it coaching CrossFit group classes and trying to pursue a career that I otherwise wouldn't have if I didn't go through that time. So I think if I were to enter the real world, obviously you can still develop those skills. But when you're in an environment with, with at a school of 30,000 people and you just are constantly talking to people and getting rejected and all this stuff, it's, it's, it's great for you as a person. Yeah. And I don't disagree with that at all. And what you're talking about is coming of age, right? Like a, um, what we've lost in a lot of ways in our more modern societies also are, um, these coming of age rituals, you know, like a lot of, you know, tribal, uh, types of, um, societies, you know, there's like a, there's a, um, some sort of ritual to manhood or to womanhood or whatever. And that, so that's part of it. And, and what you're saying, in my opinion, is not the education that you received that changed your life? It was the, like, well, exactly what you said. It was the experience of coming of age that really changed you. And so what do you think about this idea? Like, this is kind of something that taught that, that lives rent free in my brain. And I think about a lot is some form of other countries do this, and I know maybe this is anti-American, so I don't know how we, we we think about that. But like some sort of mandatory service at a at a age of coming of age, right? Like, and I'm not really saying military service, although that could be. What, maybe you have three options, right? Like, what if you have you could choose military service, something like the Peace Corps, or something. Um, I don't know, some other option, right? you got three options. And then that's your, you know, that's your mandatory coming of age ritual that like, and that, that brings you into adulthood being a, a, a good citizen and, and, and all these other things. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think about that? My, my initial reaction is no, obviously for probably the same reasons that youth say it's un-American, but just like taking, I don't know. I don't like taking think the decision away from people. However, uh, I do think what you're getting at here is something that I've been giving a fair bit of thought to lately, which is that the world that we're living in right now, when it comes to mental health, obviously mental health is a very important conversation that we need to be having. But I think a lot of people think about their own mental health in the wrong way way. I heard somebody talking about it recently on a podcast and I can't remember who it was, but they put it very beautifully. And it was that most people think that their mental health and well-being is something that they carry around with them wherever they go. Like this is a part of you that um, you bring with you and you have it, you know, like your depression is it's in your back pocket. Mm. And that's not true. Mental health is a result of the self and what the self is probably in most people's uh, understanding it's mind, body, spirit, but it's also all of the external things that are not you also make up you. And so for example, as a head coach of a fitness gym, that's part of me. That's part of myself. And that has nothing that's external. Like that's not anything that is internal. And, and the mistake that a lot of people make is they think that their mental well-being has everything to do with what's internal and what's inside. And while a, a large chunk of that is true, I think a, the, the individualization as a society that we've gotten to is part of the problem. I've said this before on the show, but family in, in other cultures is a good example of this. In America, when you're 18, it's like, see you later, buddy. I raised you. You're on your own now. 
Uh, my family's not personally like that, but a lot of other, it's like in a lot of other cultures, when you are born, you are a part of the family forever. Like you we're seeing that, um, families buying like compounds and building multiple houses on it. And it's a, this very supportive systematic way of living because, you know, I'm engaged. My romantic relationship is very important to me. Most people would say I shouldn't allow that relationship to dictate my feelings. So if my partner isn't doing well and she's going through something that's outside of me and she's going to have to deal with that on her own. Yeah. She's a, she's going to, need to do a lot of that self work on her own, but that relationship affects me. And so kind of what I'm getting at here is if you forced those things, like you're saying, whether it's military or it's Peace Corps, or you become a scribe or something, and you spend four years in a library re reading books, what that would do, it was, it would teach you that you can, you need to give yourself to something. You need to pick something and you need to give part of yourself to it. And it needs to be this obligation that whether it's making your bed every morning because you're in the military or showing up and building a house for somebody in a in another country because you're part of a Peace Corps, or it's waking up every morning and hitting the books because it's your obligation. I think forcing people to, at least for some time, having something that they're required to do and seeing the results of that work would would a lot of people would grow exponentially during a time like that. Yeah, absolutely. And and actually that makes me think about like maybe that's my beef with education as it is right now is that I I have a daughter in college right now. She she goes to American University. And and really I think what we're taught what we teach our kids now is like education it's it's like all about you and you need to develop yourself so you can go have your career and you can go make your money and and it's really not emphasized enough about how you can become a person who contributes to the world in meaningful ways right like how can i be a part of something bigger than myself it's all just like go get as much knowledge as you can or learn this skill so you can go you know, dominate the workplace, like on your own kind of, kind of thing. And I think that's kind of like the discourse that really frustrate, frustrates me about, about it. Cause I agree with you wholeheartedly. Like when I was a social worker, I was massively engaged in the justice system and I, and I have major beef with criminal justice system as it is now. And I want, and I wanted to overhaul it with a restorative justice process, which is essentially kind of what you're talking about. Like if I broke into your house and I stole your TV, right? I didn't, I, it wasn't a crime against the state, right? Like that wasn't a, I, I, it was a crime against you as a victim, as a member of my community, as a member of my tribe, I hurt the the collective because I hurt you. And I don't think we have that mentality at all. It, it's not part of our society in any way, shape or form, you know, and I would love to find systems that engage our populations and help re them remember that this is bigger than you. We, we are a, we, and if you're not operating at your highest level, or if you hurt somebody else in the group, you hurt us all. And, and, um, it's just, it's not talked about enough. Yeah. And how do you simultaneously provide, you have to make sure people do it on their own and the way you do it is by making sure that they know it's important because a lot of times I think what happens is you give people the freedom to make the choice and then they make the choice for themselves. And that's hard. Cause it's like at a very basic level, this is a great example growing up my little brother had this issue where my mom would make cookies and you know, we'd come downstairs and I'd see him eat the, eating the last cookie and I haven't had any yet. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, did you eat the cookies? He's like, yeah, bro. I had five. And, and I'm like, I hadn't had any cookies, man. Like, and you, and you ate the last one without asking. And my parents would always say, Sam, like if you eat four cookies, that's fine. But if there's one left, no matter what, you ask everybody if they want it. And it took him years to get that. But it was like his instinct was, I'm going to eat the cookie. It's instinct yeah. to, to take the last cookie for yourself. And you need to learn how to not do that because it's not a way to function in society. 
Right. And I think that's the, that's the, um, the difference of like human nature. My personal human nature is to survive, is to stay mm. alive. Like that's what my ecosystem, my human ecosystem inside of me, my brain job is to keep me alive like that. It's basic level. And so our instinct is eat all the cookies, eat all the food, hoard everything for me. You know, I think our job as like parents, as family, as neighbors, village, all the things collectively, we have to kind of like train the human nature out of us so that we can all elevate together. You know, I think that's the dance. I think that's really all we're here for in this existence is to kind of figure that out, you know? Yeah. There's that, um, Chinese proverb that civilized the mind and make savage the body. Um, I think about civilized the mind often. What you just said, I was listening to this debate on a podcast between, uh, somebody who is arguing for, um, having one lifelong partner and having multiple partners at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that was, I had never heard it articulated this way, but the guy who was arguing for the one lifelong partner was like, you're going to allow your literal lowest level human instinct, which is have sex and reproduce to dictate how you live your life. You're going to allow the lowest level instinct to, to choose for you what you want out of this whole thing. And when I heard that, I was like, yeah, that, that's a thought and feeling that I've had towards a lot of things where it is okay to try to level up, uh, what your, what your software is, you know, yeah. like after you, you, to that point, that's why, that's why there's so much obesity. It's because we've never had an abundance of food. Uh, and your instinct is telling you to just keep eating and preserve the calories, but you know, after you've been, after you've eaten, after you've drank, after you've slept, if you have shelter, if you have a relationship and, you know, you have the opportunity to decide the things that you want to accomplish in life. And I think that not enough people, people go through the motions and they just operate on default setting and they don't ever try to go in there and change it. Yeah. I, and I would agree with that. I mean, like going back to the, uh, the arguments for monogamy versus polygamy, like, and I've heard this argument before, um, probably not the same one you're, you're referencing, but like, I hear people talk about it almost like evolution, right? Like they're, they're like saying, I don't know if I believe this, but this makes sense conceptually on paper that what you're saying is true, right? Like if you're going to follow the curriculum, like if you're in a, a college class, you start with the basics, lowest level hanging fruit of, of the information. And that's polygamy. In my, my opinion, it's like, yeah, have sex with everybody and like have multiple relationships at the same time. Like you're a toddler, you know, like live like and, the and you, yeah, you evolve and learn over time that the ultimate version of relationship is to be able to maintain a loving, longstanding, committed, healthy relationship with one person, because that's the PhD, right? Like that's the, that's the doctoral studies. Cause that's been hard you know? Yeah. Um, I've talked about this a ton on the show and I think I've finally got to a good definition of what I mean. And it's the comparison of goodness versus greatness. We, you uh -huh. and I have talked about this before. Yeah. I think this came to me in the shower the other day, uh, but <laughs> doing it. something in the name of greatness is sacrificing someone else's experience for your own. Doing something in the name of goodness is sacrificing your experience for someone else's. Interesting. So, for example, Michael Jordan, to be the best NBA player of all time, I, he had to miss weddings. He had to miss birthday parties, uh, couldn't stay up late, had to say no to family, all for the sake of training and giving his life to the sport of basketball, where goodness is sacrificing myself and my maybe even my ambitions and goals to to do those things be there for your best friends when they're getting married show up to their birthday parties uh take the clothes off your back to give to somebody who needs it more than you or or whatever it is but sacrificing someone else's experience for your own is greatness is the is the ticket to greatness and sacrificing your experience for someone else's is the ticket to goodness yeah it's interesting i like thinking about that i haven't thought about it in those terms, but I hear, um, 
you know, I read and I study different things. And I think another way of saying that, like, as I'm tossing that around in my brain is people who are going to be like highly high achievers, like really successful at things. Like I'll even say this to a lot of my clients when I'm talking to them is you're going to have to say no to a lot of shit. Like you're going to have to only say yes to one or two things to be like really great at it, you know? And the alternative is, and then I hear through like maybe like Eastern philosophies and things like that. Or, you know, when I'm, when I'm in my meditation time and if I'm following a guided meditation, there's this mantra that, or affirmation that sometimes gets in multiple different practitioners that I'm listening to. They'll say something about like, say yes to more, say yes to more. And that's very counter to the, what I just said, you're having to say no to more things so that you can be great. And so I think that's the difference. Goodness, being open and being a part of the universe and being connected means you're gonna have to say yes to more. And then greatness is going to be like, nope, you can only say yes to one or two things. You're going to say no to everything else. So as I'm tossing that around, what you said, I think that makes a lot of sense, you know? And what is the right answer? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, I want to be a great fitness coach. I want to be a great podcaster. I want to be a great partner. Uh, And so these two things don't exist opposite of one another. They're just two separate metrics. And so to that point, I think, for example, I've, I really like music and I really like art. Those are two things that I've not really ever pursued in my life. Because to me, whether I get more enjoyment out of it, fulfillment, uh, the the physicality of things, jiu-jitsu, being a fitness coach, just seems like it's more my thing. And so I'm sacrificing the ability to do the musical and the artistic things uh, for the sake of the other stuff. And so I also think we live in a world where the bar is pretty low for what it takes to achieve certain things, right? Build a big podcast, you know, like Cameron and I probably don't, we probably spend like four to six hours a week doing this show, which isn't anything to scoff at, but it's, uh, you know, I'm not dedicating my, my entire life to this thing. So I do think in our day and age, you have a little bit of wiggle room there to play around with, right? Where you, you know, you're trying to do both things in a certain context. What's important to me though, is that I never, sacrifice a, a, the opportunity to do good for the opportunity to be great. You know, I would rather help more people and nobody ever know my name than to pursue something all in hopes that, you know, people know who I am and, and aspire to be like me. Yeah. I think you can do both. I mean, you can't do both at the same time. I don't think, I don't know if, I mean, maybe it's possible. We probably maybe have some examples of people in the world that like maybe have been great and done good at, uh, at the same time. But I do think it comes in like ebbs and flows. It's like a pendulum of swinging. Like you mentioned Michael Jordan, which is like a, maybe he's not going to be the best example of what I'm about to say, but like, we'll just go with it. He's maybe he's debated as the greatest basketball player of all time. He was great. And he now, because he was great, has the opportunity to do a lot of good. And maybe he does. I don't know what his donations are like, or like what his philanthropy is. I don't know anything about that part of him, but we know he was pretty savage as a basketball player. I mean, that's well-documented. But, you know, I think you can go back and forth between greatness and goodness and and really use that platform of greatness to to do the good, you know? I would agree with that. And, uh, it, like, that's a pretty age-old story, you know? Like, uh, this guy left it all. He was, he was a prodigy, and he left it all to go do whatever for whoever and was able to do lots of good in the world. I think Matt yeah. Fraser is a good example of this. Uh, in the CrossFit space for five years, he literally dedicated every ounce of his being to winning the CrossFit games. And he did every single year. And now that once he finished and he started doing all of interviews, everybody thought Matt Fraser was this huge asshole and like just wouldn't talk to anybody. And when he got Mm -hmm. done with his career and he retired and people were asking him about it, he was like, yeah, man, I just, if I did an interview, it, it took away my focus from training. 
Uh, yeah. If I, if I didn't sleep in my, every single thing in his life was to make his body perform at an optimal level. Literally not one thing did he do that, that made him worse. Right. Yeah. And now that he's retired, he talks about it all the time. Now he works out like an hour a day. He spends a lot of time working on his business, HWPO, providing a great program, a fitness program for people that are that are looking to get in shape. And he's doing a lot of good. So I think greatness is, is a platform to eventually do good. But it is very difficult to do both at the same time. And oftentimes what you find at a high level is when people start to do good, that is what, that is what they give up is, is, uh, their ability to be great, which I think is fine. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's fine. It's just choices. And like, it's like, I think what people don't realize, and I think you and I talked a little bit about this on a past episode is just know you have a choice. Like, don't, don't try to lie to yourself and say, you got, you only, I, I can only do this, or I can only do that. Like, just know that like at any given moment, Matt Frazier is a good example because to uh, all of us in the uh, public eye, it kind of came out of nowhere, right? He like overnight said, I'm done. That's it. And, and, and he made that choice. He just kind of walked away from it. And we can all do that at any moment on either side of that coin. And I think, I think that's just really important for, for us all, for us all to know, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll share this with you too. Something cool that's happened to us recently. Do you did you listen to the episode on this on the show with Dr. Tracy Valencourt who did uh, was on the bullying? That was one of the earlier ones, right? Yeah, I think it was episode fourteen. Yeah, I I, re- I listened to that one. Okay, so I interviewed her, right? Mm-hmm. And I think three or four weeks ago, Chris Williamson on Modern Wisdom interviewed her. What? And this episode came out, right? Yeah, she's super awesome, dude. Like research head uh, in Canada. She studies a lot of um, women dynamics. She is also a like a U-17, one of the provinces in Canada's women's soccer coach, like national level. She like studies the dynamics of the team and how gender differences are with uh, social interactions and things like that on top of bullying as well. But I texted Cayman uh, and I was like, dude, all of a sudden overnight, like our Tracy Valencourt episode got like 300 extra views on YouTube. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And then a couple of weeks goes by and I'm, I'm scrolling through and I, I see that he interviewed her and I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Yeah. Right. So number one, super awesome that that happened. But two, uh, I've listened since listened to my recording with her again and I've listened to the Chris Williamson episode. And what's very cool to me is the guy who I try to – I'm copying this guy And when it comes to being yeah. doing a podcast. I literally have a – this is what my interview could have been and this is what my interview was. And you know, I've, I've taken notes on it. What's the difference? What can I do better to uh, improve my, my ability as a podcast host, et cetera? And uh, that's something very recently that's happened that I think is a huge – I guess, uh, underrated thing that's happened to us. That's amazing. Well, that's super, that's a co- super cool. What's well, a testament. I mean, it's a testament to you and the quality of the people that you're trying to get on your, on the show, because like someone like, like Chris Williamson is like a great example of somebody who gets, who, who does it right. You know, he clearly is throwing his whole life into this thing and he's like really focused on it. So I think it's a great affirmation for like what you're doing to, to have that. And then like, what a great opportunity, like you just said, to be a student of what you're doing. You know, you have this contrast and like, you know, how, where the conversation could have been doing. I, this is a silly, very silly uh, example of that, but like, you know, I, I did a jujitsu tournament recently and, um, and I had someone record all of my, my matches and I just, I literally broke, I, I was able, it was nice to be able to have a way to like break down every little movement where you know what i mean and and be able to just be a student right just be just be a learner so what a what a cool kind of different way for you to learn your craft you know and what's interesting about it is there's so many subtleties to doing a podcast that you don't really think about until you start to do them and chris williamson understands that very well which is one of the reasons why i admire his show so much just simple stuff you know like when somebody's talking and and 
if anybody's listening, we also do this YouTube show. So there's video. When you're talking, I'm doing a lot of nods, like trying to uh, trying to show you that I'm paying attention. And I'm at the beginning of the show, I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was just so annoying when I would listen back to it, like, oh, that doesn't make the audio experience very good. And it's just little things like that. But to now have what I would consider almost a picture perfect interview with the same person that I was able to interview, it it points out the flaws in my not that I had a bad episode, you know. I can't compare myself to him at all. He's 12, 13 years older than me, has been doing this podcast thing for many more years than I have. But just to see the differences and and be able to put them side by side and draw a direct comparison is such a helpful tool. Yeah. Hell yeah. And and it's cool that you're not beating yourself up over it too. I think there's a there's a mindset of a certain type of person who would just like really just run themselves through the dirt and just like beat the hell out of themselves in the process of seeing like something like, like that, you know? And so, um, you know, that's, it's really cool for, to see that you, you truly are a student and a learner and rather than just someone who's just trying to be a high performer at all costs. And when you don't perform, maybe at whoever's level of expectation, you can really do some damage, you know, psychologically, you know? Yeah, I mean, I am hard on myself. I, you know, I think I, I pretty much end every single interview, and I look at Cam, and I'm like, "That sucks, dude." We, <laughs> you know, like I'm never gonna get good at this thing, and he's always like, "You're fine, man." Like, what's the problem? And then I listen back, and then I'll text him like a week later, and I say, "You know, man, I listened back, and it was it was actually better than I thought." And so, uh, I think the difference is when I hear it, instead of getting frustrated, what it does is it motivates me to, I could have done that, like. I talk to the same person about a slightly different topic, but about similar topics. I'm very much, have you read the creative act by Rick Rubin? It's on my list. Yeah. I haven't read it yet, Dude, but move it to the top. It's so good. Okay. Uh, done. But he talks, I'm, I'm sure if you've even heard him talk, he talks a lot about as a creator, what the point of having a habit as a creator, like a writing habit is so that you can create space to receive something that the universe already has created. So if I'm writing a story, his view is that story already exists. I need to be receptive enough to receive it and then record it. Mm -hmm. And obviously like myself and the individual, you put your own twists on it and that's what makes it creatively unique about you. But I kind of view that in a very similar way. Not, not that it's, I don't want it to sound as, I don't think it's as hokey as I'm making it sound, but I talk to the same person about the same topic. And if I had that exact same conversation, I could have pulled so much more out of it than I, that I did. And I see that with the direct comparison to his show with her. Mm -hmm. And so I think having it, it less so frustrates me and it more motivates me to aspire to be able to do that with people. Yeah. I think it's like a really healthy way to look at that. And I think the thing that I've learned, I've been so fortunate to get to be around some like really elite people in a lot of different fields. You know, I've just kind of like stumbled my way. And I think what I learned from that and what I'm hearing you say in this conversation right now is the difference between me and them, these elite people who I look up to, who've accomplished these amazing feats and, or maybe careers or whatever, whatever it is, it's such a small difference between me and them, you know, like in my military career, the majority of the guys that I served with all went on to do those crazy jobs that movies are made about, you know, and I was doing the same stuff as them. In a lot of ways, I outperformed them in some areas when we trained together. And that like, that's inspiring to me to know that if I chose to do this and go hard in this particular area, I could, I could be, uh, what you were talking about earlier, great, right? I could choose to be great, you know, because I have the abilities. And I think that's what I'm hearing you say is like this guy who you look up to, you consider to be elite in a particular field is doing a, just a couple tiny little different things that made a big difference, but you have all the same exact tools, you know? Yeah. And I think another good example of this that I can draw most recently is I had Wall Street weightlifter on the show a couple of weeks ago, um, and I, Graciano Rubio, and I also just recorded an episode a couple of weeks ago with Adrian Bosman. That comes out cool. Uh, 
next week. I think that one comes out next week. But yeah, you're right. Like I'm talking to these guys and I'm, I'm nervous before and they're, they're these mysterious figureheads in the space that I really love and am, and, am, and am in. And then I start talking to them. I'm like, oh, these guys are the same as me. They like, yeah. they like fitness. And, and it's nice, especially with the Gracia and Rubio, when I was talking to him, I really understood his workout methodology and how he structures his strength training well very well before talking to him and being able to navigate that conversation with the framework that I had, uh, it was just reaffirming to me like, Oh, you know, I do know what I'm talking about. And I think yeah. especially as a young professional, you know, this is probably true at any stage in your career, but especially as a young professional, it's very nice to get validated. Not even like they didn't say anything nice to me, but just leaving the conversations with, uh, you know, I, I could hang with those guys or I understood what they were saying and that makes you feel good. Yeah, I think that goes all the way back to something I'm tossing around for myself, kind of where I led the earlier part of the conversation is where I think the difference between people who we tend to look at as really successful and like where I look at myself is what those folks do is realize they had a unique ability, like they have a unique ability and they really like focused on that. And one thing that I'm trying to do is I know I have unique abilities and I just want to create my personal brand around Though, you know, I want to put that out there like, hey, these are my unique abilities. This is how I serve the world and kind of <clears throat> just kind of put it out there a little more. Because I think like you, like, you know, um, Adrian uh, Bosman or um, any of those folks is just they, they just really found their niche and they stayed in that niche and they became they, they had a, they developed their own brand around it. You know? Yeah. Uh, do you know that it's a common cliche phrase where it's like, don't compare your chapter one to somebody else's chapter 10 or whatever it is? Yeah. I think a good flip to that is not only should you not be comparing your chapter to somebody else's later chapter, but you also haven't read their book. You know your own book because you lived it. I, I had this conversation with a client this morning. We were talking, I can't even remember what we were talking about, but she was said something about me that was kind of it was a compliment, something about one of a trait that I have that was admirable. Um, and I still very much view myself as how I was when I was like 14, you know, I obviously think about myself a little bit more positively and I'm confident, but dude, I just played video games and I'm pretty easy going and that's my nature. So when somebody says something to me <clears throat> about some characteristic that I have, sometimes it makes me go, Oh yeah. You know what? Like I am, I am like that. I am a, I have run 100 miles, you know, and not, that's not even in like an egotistical way. It's just like a, it's you need to remind yourself some of the things that you've done and been through, because I think most of our default setting is to, is to resort to, you know, our, our more soft natured characteristics or how we were when we were younger. Um, I'm in a place where I have a very healthy relationship with that. And I'm very accepting of the fact that that was the kind of person that I am. And I look, look back at it pretty fondly, but you forget sometimes that you were looking at not only somebody else's, chapter later on but you don't you don't get to see when they were also the awkward uncomfortable teenager trying to figure it out yeah and then like i think what you picked up on and what i've picked up on also is that like their their backgrounds aren't that much different than yours you know and we tend to put people on pedestals but really there's really not that much difference you know we all kind of go we all live a very similar human existence and they're very small margins of variation, you know? Yeah. You're generally just a product of the time and place you were born. And, you know, that sort of dictates the the path that is that is laid before you. It's very similar to, oh man, I've said this a lot on this podcast. I've, heard, I've been listening to a lot of shows lately. I can't remember who said this, but life is very much, you just land, you wake up and you land in this desert. And there's this, there's an infinite number of deserts on an infinite number of planets in an infinite number of universes. And you just land on the one you land on. And then you have to decide which direction do I go. And it's usually intuition that points you in this direction. And once you start, you're not stuck on that path. Like we talked about earlier, you can change it, but it almost puts guardrails on what it is that you can accomplish. And the farther along you get in life, the less choice you're going to have to make as to the direction of it. Yeah. I think there's like a whole level of, um, 
I don't know. I, I have a lot of thought about that, but like, like, you know, like there's a whole level of like spirituality around that and stuff that people have beliefs around it. And I mean, right. Like, like, for example, you, if you were born in, I don't know, uh, let's just say Germany, right? Same time, same day. Maybe Germany's not the best example, but let's, I'm going to go with it. You are probably not going to be in the NFL. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you just weren't born in the country that is going to develop you and foster you at, to be an NFL player. Like period, that level of greatness is out of your option, you know, and it's just the way it is. I'd probably be into beer cheese and driving BMWs. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or soccer or something else, you know, but yeah. Yeah. Um, well, but listen, yeah. man, I think that has a, uh, kind of a good place to wrap it up is there anything else that you'd like to add i want to make sure you get your workout in yeah no man it's uh no this has uh been awesome again like i i really appreciated the conversation and um yeah i'm 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 honored to be on the show so i really appreciate it yeah the next time you're on we'll have to like cut you a check or something but thank you for being the honorary <laughs> good people co-host well i appreciate you man thanks for having me on the show yeah absolutely i appreciate you thank you so much Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of Good People. If you guys are watching on YouTube before you head out, please like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on our notifications so you don't miss our weekly uploads. If while you were listening, you enjoyed, please share it with someone you love, perhaps your grandma. We'll see you next time. Dun, 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 dun. I cut it.